I'm ready to open now. And I forgot to, um, Jim, um, when we get to it, I'm going to ask you to lead us in the, salute the flag, the okay, Pledge of Allegiance. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're so glad to have you here tonight. Um, we have an exciting presentation tonight, and of course we're going to start with that. But let me first um, open us with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We just praise you, Father, for all the blessings in our life. Especially, Father, this amazing city that where we live and we call home, this whole greater Pensacola area. We are so blessed, and uh, we thank you for everything that you uh, do bless us with in our lives. And I thank you for every person here and the homes and families they represent. And uh, we just ask you to bless our evening together tonight. And continue to, uh, we thank you for all, all the work that has been going forward in a positive manner with the Benson House. And we just ask you to continue to lead us and guide us. And we love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. And then we're going to do, if you'll rise, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. And we'll have our Vice President, Jim Cox, lead us in that. and is, is general manager and editor and everything else of the Gulf Breeze News for about 500 years now, right? And then also uh, uh, her, a, a, a Lydia friend, Tonis. Lydia, what's your last name, Lydia? Tonis. Tonis, Lydia Tonis, okay. Uh, last year, uh, uh, she had a stroke, okay, and Lydia helped her recover from it, and uh, she thought that it was a good idea to get Lydia here because, you know, we're all getting up there, okay? <laughs> and you know, tell us about the, the stroke prevention program, okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for allowing me to come. My name is Lydia Tonis. And uh, prior to me becoming the stroke coordinator for Baptist Healthcare, I was a nursing instructor at University of West Florida, and I was really into learning theories, and one of the learning theories was that if you do something memorable uh, <laughs> with your presentation, that people are actually gonna remember the content about 40% more. So I thought about that, I was like, what should I do? I'm like, I'll wear a jacket. And then of course, I started presenting this way when I do orientations at uh, Baptist Hospital, and some of the people who see me in the hallways they don't remember actually what I presented on, they remember my jacket. So, this might be backfired on me, but today I hope you'll be able to, you know, pair up a little bit of what I'm trying to, to share and, and kind of educate about, but uh, today, whenever you walk away, you'll probably just, you know, think about the signs and symptoms of stroke, uh, what to do in case you recognize something that might look like a stroke. Uh, we're gonna just kind of, briefly touch on some treatment options, and then close up with what are maybe some ways to prevent a stroke, because uh, believe it or not, um, you know, it's the number one leading disability for, you know, uh, any kind of, um, you know, long-term medical condition, so we don't want it to be number one for much longer, so we're trying to really increase awareness to prevent them all the way around. Let's go ahead and get started got my fancy slideshow here. So when I say stroke, what comes to your mind? Um, Barbara, what comes to your mind when I say stroke? Um, paralysis. Yeah. Paralysis. Yes, absolutely. Um, Jim, what comes to your mind whenever I say stroke? I'm going to fall down. Yeah, falls, maybe immobility, right. incoordination. Yeah, anybody else, what comes like to your brain first thing? Yeah. Death. Death. Yep, it's actually the number five cause of death in America. So what a stroke is, it's an interruption in the flow of blood to the brain. And we actually have two types of strokes. 
we have one, uh, the most common one, in fact, 85% of our strokes are ischemic strokes. And so what that means is in the blood flow to the brain, a little clot, a little booger, um, will get in the way of the blood flow. And just like a heart attack, you know, when the heart muscle doesn't get the blood flow because of a blockage, it starts to die, you get pain, and um, all of those symptoms that come with it. And so for the brain, whenever you get a um, clot that gets in the way of the blood flow, you don't actually get pain and all of those dramatic presentations of a heart attack. It's very different. We'll talk about that in just a second. But that is the most common type is a blood clot, disrupts the blood flow. The second type, about 15, 13% of our strokes are hemorrhagic. And what that means is a blood vessel in the brain bursts, maybe from excessive working out and you're just straining so hard and there might be a weakening in the vessel wall and it just with that high pressure ruptures. Um, a lot of our uh, hemorrhagic stroke population, I, I see it's because of cocaine abuse. So yeah, uh, you will raise your blood pressure whenever you use a substance like that and it will actually put so much pressure on your brain that the vessels just can't handle it, so they'll rupture. Um, if anybody has an aneurysm in their brain, maybe uh, like if you have a family member who has one, aneurysms are actually kind of tied to genetic. Um, uh, they're tied to you know family members, so if a family member may have one, talk to your doctor about possibly getting checked out for one, but aneurysms are uh, the pretty much number one cause of bleeding in the brain because they rupture. So let's go ahead and continue the conversation here. We just kind of kind of uh, described the two types. Uh, one thing I want to mention about in the ischemic one is a risk factor AFib. Anybody heard of atrial fibrillation? Probably might even know somebody with atrial fibrillation or have it yourself. It's that irregular heartbeat. When that happens, um, the blood flow just kind of stirs up a little bit in the heart, uh, stagnates for a second or two, just, I mean, milliseconds or two, but that's just enough for a clot to start kind of forming. And sometimes it may take months, uh, maybe even a year to build according to how bad somebody's AFib is, and then it will flick off and head on up to the brain and just cause a um, disruption there. So I kind of already mentioned, um, you know, a bit of the, the disability, the prevalence of, of death with having a stroke. You know, is it a real issue I should be concerned with? You know, we're gonna hear a story today. And one, one thing that I do at Baptist is that I do lots of chart reviews. I'm in the quality department. I oversee Gulf Breeze, Baptist Hospital, Navarre Freestanding ER, and J, and I'm constantly doing chart reviews and I see these uh, stories that physicians will write stories of like, um, you know, the most recent one was the um, family member uh, lives with his grandma, he's 26 years old, and kind of the common things these days with these millennials, uh, staying in longer, but he was living in with his grandma and he noticed when she came out of the room that she was still in his, her PJs. Okay, it's 8 a.m., that's not really a significant finding. However, you know, he noticed that was a very abnormal routine for her. And then uh, he noticed that her bed was still not made. She was kind of like dragging her foot and not making sense when she talked. And so he's like, this is so abnormal. Um, so we, he went ahead and actually called a family member, like, what do I do? And they, you know, recommended calling 911 to get him to the hospital, get her to the hospital. So it, it's, you know, very hard to see that these stories you know that are in the charts it's really from these like little pieces of the puzzle that somebody kind of puts together and uh, for that family you know stroke is definitely a real issue issue so let's talk about some signs and symptoms um, you mentioned paralysis and that's actually one of the signs and symptoms we use an acronym BFAST um, the B stands for balance change sudden changes in balance now how many people have balance problems like all of us, yep, like a, a lot. So, uh, you know, are we gonna be concerned with stroke, you know, right off the bat? Usually, um, I will say the, the balance issues is about 14% um, of our ischemic strokes. It's too, um, it's because of a clot to the back side of our brain, that's where we kind of control our balance and position and space. But 
Um, the big thing here is it's unexplained by anything else. The balance changes happen so quickly and it does not resolve with sitting, um, maybe taking a sip of water, uh, you change positions and nothing makes your instability go away. So I would be very concerned if something like that were to pop up on a, a loved one, myself, or something else. So it's kind of unresolved and it's persistent. The E stands for eyes. And what we're looking for is two things on the eyes. One is uh, sudden vision loss. And this could be in a partial field. It could be your full eye. Uh, you can't see out of one eye. And it could even be like where you only see the, like in your vision, you only see the left side here and the left side here. So it's like, a, it could be a number of combination of things, but the big takeaway is you have sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes, partial, full, doesn't matter. That is, you know, uh, possibly because of the occlusion to one of the arteries uh, that feed the eye. And another thing for the eyes, if somebody has what we call a gaze deviation, I'm going to illustrate. Here's my acting scale, so let's see if I can do this right. A gaze deviation is when your eyes are kind of fixed to a side, and they might be able to come, you know, under somebody's voluntary power to, like, move, but generally they'll kind of go back to a resting state that's to the side, and it could be to the left, it could be to the right, but their gaze just is, like, stuck like this. So I would be really concerned that somebody might be experiencing a stroke when they have gaze deviation. So changes of vision, changes in gaze. The next one is face. What, what I'm looking for in somebody's face is symmetry. Now, um, to be able to kind of notice somebody has a facial you know, asymmetry or, or weakness in one side or the other, I kind of need to ask them to do something. And so I'll say, uh, Mrs. Jones, you know, smile for me. And if I see that only one side pulls up, I'm really concerned that there's something wrong with the brain that tells this part, this motor section to move. So ask somebody to smile and see if, you know, one side doesn't move or not. Um, there are cases where a patient, uh, or a family member, I should say, I say patient, like we're in the hospital, for my nursing students. <laughs> Um, where somebody isn't following commands, so you'll be like, smile, smile, and they're just like staring off into space, and you're like, smile. Um, in this instance, it is acceptable and okay to try to uh, cause a little bit of painful or noxious stimuli. Um, a little way we do it in the hospital is we'll kind of get our, our, our fist right here, and we'll kind of do like a rub on the chest, a very firm rub. And uh, somebody, usually, most people will kind of like wince to this, you know, they'll kind of not feel comfortable during that stimulation. And so that's how I might be able to pick up, I'm like, oh, there's something going on with your face when I do this stimulus. So ask them to smile. If they can't smile, try to get a little bit aggressive. Um, I, I'll tell you a quick patient story. Um, we had a, a patient, uh, this was whenever I was at bedside nursing, and um, she, she went unresponsive on me, and so I called a rapid response, so they were going to come and help me, and I tried to do the sternal rub, and she didn't have any kind of reaction, and um, I told the, the husband at bedside, I'm like, okay, we're going to go ahead and have the emergency team come and assess her and help figure this out, and anyway, um, I hear, and I was like, what is happening? And I turn around, I'm still in the room, but he was like, <laughs> on, on, yeah, he was like, wake up! And I was like, no! <laughs> How do I explain the bruises? <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, she turned out being okay uh, in the end. But, uh, yeah, I recommend doing the sternal rub. Maybe not so, uh, you know, not the backhand if we can. All right, so moving on to the A and the B fast part, and that is weakness and one limb or the other. Uh, it could be the arm, it could be just the leg, but usually it's one side of the body. So just one side does not want to work, doesn't want to behave. Um, and to kind of know if this happens, sometimes it could just be through general observation. Um, in that story I was kind of mentioning where the grandson noticed his grandmother do wasn't doing well, um, she was unable to hold her paper 
and unable to hold her coffee. And so it was kind of like sloshing all over the place. And so that was a, a cue to him, something was wrong. But there was weakness in one arm. So kind of just by general observation, see if you know one is not moving like it should and it's just kind of dangling. Um, another thing that you can ask somebody to do is put their arms up like they're holding a bowl of soup and notice if the arm starts to slowly fall. And we're just talking, hold it up for five seconds. Sometimes I have to coach people at hold it up, hold it up, hold it up, try, 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 keep holding it, holding it up. And if it's still, despite their best effort, just can't stay up equal to the other one, then uh, I let them know, like, you know, I feel concerned about this finding. Um, I did have one patient one time, he was like, I didn't have a stroke, I'm fine, everything's good. And I was like, okay, all right, let's hold your arms up. And he goes like this, and then he goes, <laughs> So his hand stood on the same plane as the other, but he obviously didn't have the strength to be able to uh, maintain it out like this. So I told him he doesn't get points for that. Um, but yeah, so hands up and then try to see if it can stay up. And if not, I also you know, do feel like we might be looking at a stroke when this happens. The S stands for speech. A couple of things could happen on the speech part. We could have complete um, you know, uh, absence of speech where you're like, talk to me, what's going on? And they're like, uh, 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 like nothing comes out. And a second ago they were talking, now they're not. That's a big red flag, big red flag. Um, so complete kind of absence of speech or maybe it's slurred. Um, you know, where they're just talking, they can't articulate the words that are coming out of their mouth. So they're not able to say and just, you know, um, get out what they want to say. And, and a lot of times what I do is I ask a patient to repeat something, you know, uh, where do you live? And, or I'll say, um, you know, there's a silver lining behind every cloud. Like I'll pick a phrase that's kind of well known just to see if they can um, reply to me. So slurred speech, concern for stroke. Another one is uh, word substitution. We had this patient, uh, he was being evaluated for a uh, heart attack. And so we usually do a heart catheterization. Yeah, how am I doing, Jim? Okay, he was doing a heart catheterization and sometimes those procedures, because they're manipulating up the vessels to evaluate and image the heart, there is that risk that if there's a lot of plaque up there that one may be uh, you know kind of lifted up and disrupted and then the way the circulation goes it would go up to the brain so and that happens uh, with heart cath sometimes so anyway uh, the patient was out of the done with a heart cath he comes in the recovering nurse is talking to him and he seems to be doing well and he's like man I really appreciate the haircut that you guys gave me and she said what mm -hmm. was that and he goes, well, you know, the, the haircut, the, the, when the blue in the, in the world and the, the haircut. And he felt like he was saying everything that he wanted to say, but the words that were coming out did not make sense. Um, and so in that case, she went ahead and called a, a, called a stroke alert in the house. And then the team comes to try to evaluate what we can do. And so, um, you know, be paying attention if there's some word substitution there. That's, that's really inappropriate. The last one, uh, it says time up here, but I'm gonna give you something else to think about, and that is terrible headache. That is the new American Heart Association um, recommendation is that we push terrible headache. And what I mean by that is this is the first worst headache of your life, that you're like, what is going on? And you know, don't ever really have migraines. What is, what is this? Um, that is probably you know, a, a rupture. A blood vessel that causes that. When blood is inside the vessel, everything works good, but as soon as it gets released, it's very irritating to the lining around the brain, and that causes uh, some intense spasms, and you will get a really, really bad headache. So um, T, terrible headache, the first worst headache you have, don't lay down. My own grandma, my own grandma, um, she actually um, started having a headache and was like, and in this case, um, you know, it was kind of like, just kind of a, a 
tough woman. And so she goes, eh, it wasn't that bad, you know. <laughs> but she's like, I'm gonna go lay down, and that's not really her thing. And then her foot started dragging a little bit, and she thought maybe it was just a little bit sleepy. And so afterwards, when she woke up, uh, we noticed that she couldn't move her leg at all. So she went to bed and then took her to the hospital, and she did have a, a small bleed in her brain from her blood pressure getting too high. So um, anyway, we'll try to uh, talk about some interventions for what patients, uh, or for a stroke here, but I don't wanna scare you guys, but the big thing is, I know, like everybody's walking away like, oh, I have a scratchy throat, stroke. <laughs> but the big thing is, is usually it's pretty, um, you know, comes out of nowhere comes out of nowhere when it happens and we're just gonna be ready when it does. Uh, and uh, the T, as you saw in the last one, stands for time. Now it is very tempting to maybe call somebody, double check you know, your symptoms. Does these make sense to you? Should I be worried? Um, I know I might even do that. I think, um, what was it today? Today I took my, my son to the doctor and so I, I was a little worried about uh, his development, how he's coming along and anyway, the doctor was like, um, all these red flags were there, uh, you know, the, the ear problems, well, okay. And he anyway mentioned that we, we can easily write off the symptoms by, you know, relating it to something else. The big thing is, is like, go ahead, call 911, tell them what you're concerned of and just have that conversation with the dispatcher and um, you know, get in through the EMS if you can. We can actually give a pre-alert to the hospital and the team mobilizes and they're actually there at the door kind of waiting for you when you roll in versus doing uh, you know, a, a drive-in. So try to, if you're having somebody experience the stroke symptoms, call 911 instead. And what happens? What happens when I get in the hospital, you know? Um, I have a pacemaker, is that gonna be compatible? I'm a little nervous about that, or I'm claustrophobic. All of those things are, are, are important concerns, but the first thing we're gonna do is do a head CT. A CT scanner does not interact with your pacemaker. It's safe, it's fine. It doesn't have a magnet in it like the MRI does. And so the scan takes about, honestly, 15 seconds. It does a quick little whirl around and it lets us know if there's any kind of blood in your brain. Now, uh, here's where we're always like pushing for time is uh, of the essence. So whenever you have a, we'll go with the most popular type of stroke, ischemic stroke, the immediate brain tissue where the blood was flowing to, it's gonna die. It's gonna die and we call that the core. We can't bring the core back. Over time, your body may be able to grow new neurons to help kind of connect with each other, but in that moment, your core is not salvageable, as we say. What is salvageable is that area around it called the penumbra, and that's kind of illustrated here in that like bluish area. And so, uh, some I actually saw a shirt one day that said, save the penumbra, and <laughs> it's all about um, trying to restore that, um, restore that one uh, blood vessel that's kind of blocked so the other tissue can continue to um, you know, not die. It's at risk for dying because it's you know, cut off. Thankfully, the body is so well designed, it can actually you know, help you know, flow blood to it through other routes, but they're not the primary route. We want the primary route restored. So um, it doesn't take long for the penumbra to turn into a core if we don't move quickly. Uh, this is a little bit of a side view of uh, what the collateral circulation means. So the brain does have that ability to kind of go through a back door to feed itself, but it's slower when it takes that detour to feed the target tissue. So here's what we can do for you. So you come in, we do a scan, we talk to you about your, your medical history, uh, your med list, uh, family. If you are with somebody who's experiencing these symptoms, do make sure to say, I am here and try to be in that room because when we're interviewing and trying to get this information, we want the uh, family at bedside. But most people can actually receive 
um, tissue plasminogen activator within about three hours. You have a three hour window from the time that your stroke happens to um, you know the, the time we give you the med, that's not a lot of time. So that's why we're recommending, you know, just get to the hospital and we'll take it from there. There are a few select patients like don't have diabetes, um, you're not 100 years old, like we might be able to, you know, give you up to 4.5 hours, but no more than 4.5 hours. So most patients can get it within three hours. Um, some patients, we might be able to extend it a little bit more to four and a half hours. Now, uh, that being said, uh, the one drug may not fix. It's not 100%, especially if your clot is very large and in a special, you know, large vessels. Um, you know, one in three patients basically will kind of return to normal. So I would like to be part of that one, one of three. So I want to get to the hospital as soon as I can and, and possibly uh, go ahead and take that, um, that TPA is what we call it. The three. Is that a shot or a pill or what is that? Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Uh, we use the shot form. Okay. So it is a injection over five seconds. <laughs> and is that three to four and a half hours how long you get it? Or oh, you mean from, you from have to get the shot within three hours of having the stroke? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yep, have to have it within three hours of having the stroke. Okay. I have a question. Yes. If a person is going to be I would be concerned and I would go and uh, call call 911. If. But now she doesn't like listen to her brother. <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Yes. If she went to the doctor now, mm -hmm. would they be able to tell that she had issues in the recent past? Yes. Usually, whenever you have a stroke, um, it takes about 24 hours to start showing up um, as dead tissue on a CT scan. Yep. So what's interesting about that is uh, when you come in, you're having these symptoms, can't move to one side, they scan you, and they're like, well, it's not blood. It looks like normal head, but your symptoms are telling us a story that you're having a stroke. And so we will actually, um, you know, we don't wanna wait around tomorrow to see if that stroke actually happens. So we will give it on the basis of your clinical presentation. So if a headache is her only issue mm -hmm. and it's an anomaly and they're really bad, yes. call your brother and tell her she's got a headache, what could they give her to resolve that issue that she's having? Is there anything? Yeah, they would go ahead and if she doesn't have any other exclusions, go ahead and offer her um, the TPA and say this, you know, this seems to be, you know, um, consistent with a stroke. We're gonna go ahead and offer you this treatment. And I will say, if we give TPA and it turns out to be a migraine, uh, that's actually okay. Um, the, there's like a long list of exclusions, but sometimes that happens where uh, patients come in, or set of their life, and sometimes even migraines, complicated ones, you'll have numbness in your face, your arm will feel numb, and the doctor says, well, I'd rather be right than wrong, um, you know, because you could permanently, if we thought it was a migraine and didn't treat it, you would permanently have those issues. So, um, yep, that happens. Okay. That's a great question. And we do have very stubborn uh, patients. It's usually their family members that are <laughs> the ones talking, the patients well, she's like. she's in a very high stress job. Mm. And um, that's a concern. Yes. Can you, before you finish, could you talk? Briefly about TIA. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, don't let me forget that. And I'm at 6:30, right? Okay. We're gonna uh, kind of close, wrap this up, and I will touch on TIAs. So the second option you have is something called a clot retrieval, um, or fancy word is thrombectomy. There are in the main circulation, right behind your jaw, um, very large vessels that just start branching into the smaller ones and if a big blood vessel kind of lodges, big blood vessel, big clot lodges there, we have tools to be able to get that out by going through a vessel in your leg, 
we'll fish a little, uh, little, looks like a teeny little straw up there and we will suck it out. And it is incredibly because you will pretty much instantly restore blood flow and I've seen patients like start to move their arm after that. I was part of the team uh, previously that did these and it was just such a joy to see like a miracle happen. I, I sometimes tear up thinking about it. Um, but here is a little bit of like a before and after image. No, go back. This is a before and after image of somebody where the large, oh, I hope I, I bet I have it on a timer. Here you can see there was uh, no contract for fusing and going past to the rest of the tissue. So we went in, sucked it out, and then this is fabulous. I am so sorry then that whole chunk of his brain, the temporal lobe was able to receive blood flow after that. Wow. So yeah, and uh, he is one happy guy. And he was uh, 46, 46. Yeah. And so um, some things that we can change. I wanna make sure to give her some time to, to tell her story, because that, that really brings home to share your narrative after really a traumatic event in your life. It's very scary to go through. Um, you know, TIA, uh, transient ischemic attacks, they're usually like little mini strokes, uh, warning signs before the big one. So I have some patients who will be sitting at home, they will experience, you know, the drooping of the face, one arm won't move, and they're like, oh, this is kind of weird, oh, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna just, you know, kind of sit here for a second, next thing you know, it resolves. And they're like, wow, that was kind of weird. Here's what happens is they had legitimate a blood clot in their brain and it got stuck but the body is so good like it wants to fix itself so it actually will kind of send a little bit of some help up there and it will break itself down and uh, yeah be able to restore blood flow the big thing is is like sometimes you don't have time to sit and wait to to know like is this a TIA or is this a big one I don't know I'm just gonna wait and see what happens. You know, meanwhile, your brain is slowly dying, right? So the big goal is, is to not guess if it's one or the other, go ahead and you know act like it is the big one. And for TIAs, because they are kind of like pre-warnings, because um, if you have a TIA, it resolves, everything gets better, I would immediately you know, still go to the hospital, let them know you had these symptoms, they resolved, because the doctor will do a full workup we're going to scan your arteries. Did it come from here? We're going to look at your heart. Did it come from here? Because if you had one, you're going to have two. You're going to have three. Like they don't just come and go. Like you're at that point in your life where um, now you're at risk for stroke, and it, it, it's down the road for you. And we can we can change it, change that for you. Um, manage high blood pressure. Um, this is the the last little slide. I'll close with this taking those medications. I know some patients don't take medications because it gives them, you know, the side effects. I feel dizzy. I kind of feel weak sometimes. Have those conversations with your doctor because they can switch them out rather than you just kind of coming off because um, maybe there's going to be a better one out there without some side effects. Um, those cholesterol, know your numbers. Um, that's really important and stay on those meds. Change your diet. The Mediterranean diet is what's being recommended right now. So fish, olive oil, uh, staying away from red meats, uh, lots of veggies, and then uh, if you smoke, try to find, um, you know, vaping is not a good substitute, but, you know, look into nicotine patches to help come off that, because that's a hard habit to break. Yes, There's a thing called FUM, F-U-M, mm -hmm. and it's a maple cigar-shaped thing that you put essential oils on a cotton core inside of. Interesting. So it's not a vape and it's not a cigarette, but FQM with the umlaut or whatever you call it. Anyway. Oh, okay. Good to know. I will say the less oil in your lungs, the better, because uh, we have had a few patients come in from, you know, just any kind of oil product kind of being inhaled. Well, they say, one place I read you don't really inhale it. You just take it into your mouth and let it out. Um, but another place I read you do, so I don't, but that's good to know, thank you, to know Wait. that, because. It reminds me of a, I think Obama said something like that whenever somebody asked him, did you smoke marijuana? He goes, oh, it was Clinton. I, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, didn't smoked, I never inhaled. I didn't inhale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
for your diabetes, check your numbers, stay away from um, you know, sugary foods. I'm always trying to advocate to lean towards uh, sugary substitutes like stevia, things like that. Um, and the exercise piece, walking. Just casual walking. I know it's gonna be hot outside, so highly recommend in the mornings and things like that. I do want to uh, leave some time for Lisa to come tell her story. What's interesting is I actually, you know, I see all the patients who come in and I'm looking at them. And uh, so I, I saw her case come in and uh, I didn't get a chance to meet you yet. And so I'm in the background monitoring things, making sure my team is doing everything and I give them feedback. If, uh, you know, maybe they, they took some blood and didn't run it to the lab, like they walked, like I have all these little markers and metrics. And so, um, Sometimes when they see me in the hallway, they're like, oh, here's Lydia. I'm like, no, guys, because <laughs> um, I'm the quality person checking everything. So anyway, when, um, yeah, yeah, uh, we were talking about strikeout stroke last year, and I'm like, you know, kind of going through my cases uh, with my marketing team, and uh, they were like, ooh, this one's a good case. Oh, we, we think we want to ask Lisa. And I was like, yes, let's do it. So I got to meet her, and she actually threw her first pitch um, at the Blue Wahoos game. So I am just very blessed to be able to work with her and kind of bring this presentation to you. So Lisa, will you please come up here and share your story? I'm, I'm going to be very brief, but yeah. um, thank you. Thank you. So I, um, I don't have a lot of these risk factors. In fact, when I, um, my husband had had a lot of issues with his heart. He has an unusual heartbeat, and so they were always sending us home with all this information about be fast and look for stroke. and. I would look at it and I'd just be like, I can't. <laughs> We're not going to have a stroke. I don't want a stroke. And so I figured if I didn't want one, then I wouldn't have one. And he would have. <laughs> well, it was about him, not me. So, um, but because I had seen so many of those, the morning that it happened, I had been up. Um, I thought it was a Saturday morning. I got up, I let my dogs out. I went back to bed. And then maybe an hour later, I got up again to let my dogs out. And I couldn't, my, my, I couldn't open the door. I couldn't open the door. And I said to my husband, something's wrong with my arm. And he was like, oh, well, why don't you get up and make breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he sounds like an animal. He's really not. But um, so he gets up. He makes breakfast. He hands me a, he said, here, take some aspirin. Gives me a glass of water and a plastic cup thing in this, and I immediately drop it. And he looked at me like, why did you do that? And I said, I didn't do that on purpose. That was, I was, I was very surprised. Um, and then he did make breakfast, and I realized I was eating with my left hand. I went, oh, wait, let me try my right hand, drop the fork. He's looking at me, I'm looking at him like, oh my gosh. Well, my sister-in-law was a cardiac care nurse, so we called her, and she said, go to the hospital, go to the hospital right now. We're like, oh. I didn't have any of the other issues, and I did do the be fast, so I had balance, I could smile, I, my eyes were fine, I could speak a sentence, but when I tried to, I was trying to raise my hands up like this, and my arm would fall. And I thought, oh, that's, that's not good. But I had, everything else was fine. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I should just go take a shower. You know, take a shower and, you know, maybe this will just wear off like maybe it was asleep. Uh, but I knew it wasn't the same, but I had no pain. I had no nausea. I had no other symptoms. Everyone said, well, you know, this sounds like a stroke. Sounds like it would really hurt. It didn't hurt at all. I just couldn't get my arm to behave. It just it would, I could move it, but it wouldn't do where I wanted it wanted to go. So we um, ignored all advice, and we drove <laughs> ourselves to the hospital. <laughs> and I walked in under my own power and was like, hi, I think I might be having a stroke. And even saying that, you think, this sounds like there are actual sick people here, and I am you know, trying to take attention for, away from those people. So I felt kind of guilty about it, but um, I will say that that moment, the entire staff leapt into uh, action. It was like someone had kicked an anthill and there was all this activity floating around me. And I had probably six people around my bed in the AR uh, doing all kinds of simultaneous tests. And um, I look over at my husband and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, this is serious. Like this is kind of a serious thing. And um, Anyway, so they asked me, you know, would you like to have this TPA? And if you have it, uh, you have a very low chance of it working. You know, and they asked, asked me over and over again, when did this happen? What time was it? What time was it? What time was it? I didn't remember. My husband 
fortunately, he always knows what time it is. He's always like, you were up at 1.15. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, and you went back to bed at 2.15. I'm like, okay. But he, he always knows what time it is. I never pay attention. But he knew what time I had gotten up, so he was very good about that. And so they were able to administer the TPA. But they did say, if you take it, you will have to stay in the hospital for, uh, in the ICU because there's a risk of, um, of bleeding. So I'm like, well, you know. And what they told us was one in seven. It works one out of seven times. You said one out of three. Uh, we'll have one out of three. We'll have like complete resolution. Oh, okay. And my husband was like, "Wait, did you say one out of seven? And I literally didn't hear them say that. Um, he's like, "So only one out of seven it works." And I was like, "That's pretty low odds." But you know, what are the what, what else can I do? And he said, "Well, how much do you use your arm?" I said, "Well, <laughs> it's my right hand. I gotta use it a lot. <laughs> and I have a grandbaby coming. I need my right arm." So we decided to do it, and within about 15 minutes, my hand was fine. I was absolutely like, hey, everyone. But I had to stay in the hospital overnight, and uh, I probably was the worst patient the ICU nurses have ever seen because I was like, not sick, you know? <laughs> I really just wanted to get up and move, and they were so afraid of everything. And they do have a lot of stroke protocols where they have to ask you a thousand questions, you know, keep, what is wrong with this picture? What am I, what am I pointing to? What is this, what is that? And of course, I'm such a little cut up. Usually I would make a joke about everything, but I realized these people take this so seriously. I cannot make a joke. This is way too serious. I, and they would probably go into a tizzy if I said the wrong thing. So I had to be very on my best behavior. And uh, so anyway, I am 100%. Uh, yeah. I absolutely am fine. And I, I, what I found out too, that Gulf Breeze Hospital is a certified stroke center, an award-winning certified stroke center. Um, someone said, well, we've got a big sign out front that says we're a stroke center. And I said, I really never noticed it. And I never really, it never occurred to me because I never thought I was going to have a stroke. Um, but anyway, we were very fortunate to have Gulf Breeze Hospital very, very, here. very fortunate. And um, I want to thank all of them for everything because it has been, every day I think, I can, I'm so happy I can do with my hand. I can brush my teeth. I can put on my mascara. I can, you know, do whatever. It's all those fine motor skills, I have them all because I was able to go to that great hospital and get good treatment. So anyway, I thought it, that would be more important to tell you that rather than the history of Gulf Breeze News because I think all of you already heard it. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all have any questions, of course, you know, call me anytime. I'll be happy to tell you anything about Gulf Breeze News, but I figured this might actually save some lives. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was taking a few pictures. Oh, okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll, but not all oh, the two okay. of them. I'll start with the back. Well, let's get, you can just sit in the back now. Let's have a seat. Oh, yeah. Uh, trust staff. Would you like a, um, or a phone? Yeah, can we find oh, there. the interior again? And I did throw the picture out is. with my right arm, <laughs> which was great. And it went over the plate. I wanted you to know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. there because I, I have a gift to raffle but I <laughs> oh, only that's right. I saw like three or four about five people uh, signed in so maybe what I'll do oh, I didn't see it. I didn't get a sticker did y'all get I didn't get a sticker raise your hand yeah because um, I've got Ruella Jim and Dave Barbara and Rusty but I feel like I'm missing somebody all right if you if you didn't get one come up here and get one And even though there's sugar in the <laughs> you can give them to whoever, your kids or your, uh, but there's some uh, oh, homemade cookies. Oh my there's, goodness. There's uh, mostly ginger crackles, and then there's some gluten-free peanut butter. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's one for you and Miss Ryder. Oh, yes, ma'am. Made by you. your age. Thank oh, you. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, did y'all bring a cookie? Did you do one for me? Do you want me to pass the cheese cake with that? Oh, there's one for you. Me too. Okay. 